Good morning and welcome to Williamsburg Baptist Church. I'm wearing the mask today to remind each of you to be safe and help keep others safe by wearing this out in public. But in order to conduct the service today, let me take it off so you all can completely understand me. Good morning again and welcome to Williamsburg Baptist Church. Our church offices are open and you're welcome to visit should you have a need. If you do, it's important for me to remind you that you must wear a mask uh, at all times when you're in the building. Our website, uh, among the list of uh, announcements, our website lists those members and friends whose need right now could use a prayer from you. So please visit the website and offer a prayer for those, those that are in need. During this time period when we are having virtual services, in order to keep ourselves together as a church family, we hold Zoom fellowship meetings on Sunday nights. You're invited and encouraged to attend and join, uh, join us for that. Well, right now we're in our 20th week of virtual services with guest pastors. We will be continuing these virtual services until conditions allow us for a safe return to live services. In striving to be better, we welcome comments and suggestions about our virtual services. Today, we welcome back Reverend Art Wright. Reverend Wright currently serves as the theologian in residence for the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship of Virginia and teaches online for Central Baptist Theological Seminary in Shawnee, Kansas. He previously served as the Associate Professor of Spirituality and New Testament at the Baptist Theological Seminary at, Biblical St at Richmond for eight years and has a Master's in Divinity and a PhD in uh, Biblical Studies from the Union Presbyterian Seminary. Art and his wife, Beth, live in Richmond, Virginia, and are members of the Tabernacle Baptist Church, a vibrant and diverse urban congregation. He was ordained at Tabernacle in 2013. Art's wife, Beth, directs the Camp Al-Kulana, a summer camp ministry affiliated with the Richmond Baptist Association. They have two young children. Art is a runner and likes baking and um, appreciates good coffee. He loves ridiculously nerdy board games and always enjoys playing guitar around a good campfire. With that, let me begin the call to worship. If you could please respond in the, uh, the normal people's responses, I'll read it and then if you can say it in your mind or at least think about it. When our world is torn apart by partisan politics, we will remember how very good and pleasant it is when kindred spirits live together in unity. When skin color becomes a point of judgment rather than a sign of diversity, we remember how very good and pleasant it is when kindred spirits live together in unity. When our own fears and stereotypes cover over the image of God in each other, we remember how very good and pleasant it is when kindred spirits live together in unity. We are called in to be with one body of Christ in this broken world. Let us worship the Lord our God. Good morning, my friends. It's that time again. It's time for this week's Talk with Children. Please gather around your computer or streaming device for this week's lesson. Hello. Hi. I brought something with me today for our lesson. 
If you'd like to do this at home, all you need to do is pause this video and go get a couple of lemon slices if you have them and some sugar. You'll take one of the lemon slices and keep it plain and you'll take the other one and put sugar around it. Go ahead and have your parents help you with this and we'll wait here on pause until you get back. Five, four, three, two, one. Here, Gabriel and Jacob, I've got some for you too. Okay. Here's one for you without sugar. Do we have okay. to eat it? You don't have to eat it. And here's I'll one with the it. sugar. Can I lick it? Okay. Well, just, just hold on to your lemon slices while we start this week's Bible lesson. Mm -hmm. Would you like one without sh sugar and I, one with? I want just one with sugar and just, I just want Just with the it. sugar. You and may I hold just, it. I okay. It. Okay. We're going to start this week's lesson. Do any of you remember the story of Joseph in the Bible? Due to time constraints today, I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but if you want to hear the whole story, I recommend you read it in Genesis chapters 37 through chapter 50. Joseph was a son to a man named Jacob, and he had 11 brothers and one sister. Joseph was the youngest of Jacob's sons, and he was also the favorite son. So much so that his dad got him a special robe that was made of many different colors. Now, when Joseph got the robe from his dad, his 11 brothers got very jealous because their dad hadn't given them anything like that. For Joseph's brothers, this jealousy turned into anger and bitterness, as jealousy often does. One day, when Jacob sent Joseph out to check on his brothers who were herding the family's flock of sheep, his brothers grabbed Joseph's special coat from him, threw Joseph into a pit in the ground until some travelers came by. When the travelers came by, they took Joseph out of the pit and sold them to the traveler, sold him to the travelers. Then they ripped the colorful coat up and dipped it into blood and told their dad that an animal had killed Joseph. That's some really bad jealousy that the brothers had, which made them sell their brother as a slave and lie to their dad about it and tell their dad that Joseph was dead. While Joseph's dad thought that he was dead and the rest of the family probably thought that he might be living a really rough life as a slave, God had another plan for Joseph. God's plan was to use Joseph to interpret dreams, and soon he found favor with the Pharaoh, who was like the king. The Pharaoh eventually made Joseph the second in command in all the land. Joseph was even put in charge of food to make sure that people got enough to eat during a famine. And a famine is like when the crops don't grow and there's a shortage of food. This shortage of food was so widespread that it reached the land where Joseph's brothers lived, and they decided to travel to see if they could get food from the man in charge of food. They didn't know that they were going to see their brother Joseph, and when they got there, they didn't recognize him. But Joseph did recognize his brothers. What do you think he did when he saw the brothers who had sold him into slavery? Do you think he hated them? and wanted to put them into jail? Probably. Probably. Joseph actually chose to forgive his brothers and to not only give them food, but to invite them to live in the same land as he did. That's pretty awesome. In today's Bible lesson, Joseph had a choice. He could choose to punish his brothers for what they'd done to him or he could forgive them and re reunite with them. Joseph chose forgiveness and God wants us to forgive others too. Can you think of a time when someone hurt you? Um, yeah. Let me think. Yeah? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell the story or? I accidentally got pushed off a of bed while playing bed wars on an actual bed. Oh, you accidentally got pushed off of a bed. That that sounds like something that would hurt us. What did you do? Did you get mad? Did you fight with the person? I didn't really get mad at all because there was pillows surrounding the bed. Oh, so you didn't get hurt. Well, that's good. But my head almost hit the pillow. Mm. Well, we have to make choices every day about whether we want to forgive people. 
Let's see what it's like when we choose to forgive others. Go ahead and take your plain lemon and take a bite out of the lemon. <laughs> what does that taste like? <coughs> it's pretty sour, huh? <coughs> Think about a time that you forgave someone. Now, take your other lemon, the one with sugar on it, and take a bite out of that. Mm. Uh, okay. Take it out of your mouth. <laughs> so, what does that taste like? Amazing! Amazing! Wait, is this the one with sugar? I don't know. How did the bitter lemon, how was the bitter lemon like or unlike not forgiving others? How did the sugar t change the taste of the lemon? How does forgiveness change our relationship to be sweeter? The first lemon was bitter, like the bitterness we feel when we don't forgive. The second lemon was sweet and tasty, like the sweetness we feel when we forgive others. God chose to forgive us when we ask, and Joseph forgave his brothers for the horrible things they did. God wants us to follow Joseph's example of sweet forgiveness and to forgive others. Let's pray. God, thank you for forgiving us. Please help us remember Joseph and find the strength to forgive people who wrong us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We want to thank you so much for joining us this week, and we hope you have a great week. We pray you stay healthy and happy. Until next time, bye! bye. Have a good day! Grace and peace to you, Williamsburg Baptist Church. It's good to see you again, even if only virtually. My name is Art Wright, and I'm so grateful for the invitation to rejoin you all in worship this month. It was a delight to help lead in worship back in April and May. Uh, and I'm excited to participate with y'all in worship these next three weeks in August. I know, uh, I know this continues to be an interesting and difficult time. Who knew we would still be meeting this way come August? As we move into a time of prayer now in worship, I am mindful that the pandemic continues to make life difficult in a number of ways for so many of us. Many of us continue to experience extreme loneliness. Many of us are experiencing daily anxiety about health and safety. Some of us are struggling with chronic and acute health issues. My hunch is that all of us are longing for meaningful connection with others, with our church community, and we are longing for some sense of return to normalcy. Meanwhile, the presidential election season is heating up in the midst of these dog days of summer. And the list goes on and on. We certainly have a lot to be in prayer for these days. So may we open our hearts to God's presence in this moment of prayer. And may we also allow our hearts to open to the needs of our sisters and brothers in Christ and to the challenges facing our nation as well as our world. Let us pray. <clears throat> Welcoming God, be here with us now. When we are alone, you make us known to our sisters and brothers. When we are lonely, you whisper, come closer, inviting us into your own heart. Great is your love for us, O oh God. God, when we wander lost and afraid, you take us by the hand so we may dwell in your kingdom. When we hunger for the crumbs of hope which the world offers us, you feed us and fill us up with the fullness of your own joy. Great is your grace for us, accepting Christ. When those around us make clear they want nothing to do with us, you persist in being our comforter. When we find ourselves wallowing in despair, you invite us to come to a sumptuous feast. Great is your hope for us, embracing spirit. God and community, Holy One, we know that you weep with us as we struggle and you welcome us into your heart and your hopes, even as we pray as Jesus taught us together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please join me in this offertory prayer. Holy God, we bring our tithes and offerings to your altar. We confess that many of us have longed to be wise and with money as the world understands it, accumulating and building our balances and portfolios. The Apostle Paul has called us to live in ways that often seem foolish to the world, and we know that means being seen as extravagant in generosity and reckless in our compassion. Help us on the journey to loosen our grip on our money and possessions and live the compassion to which you, your son, has called us. In his name we pray, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings fall. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 to 20. I wonder if you will take a moment to turn to Matthew chapter 15 with me. The text uh, and the passages that I'll be preaching on today and in the coming weeks come from the Revised Common Lectionary. And in this season, we are in a stretch in the middle of Matthew's Gospel. And so, so we pick up reading today at, at chapter 15 of Matthew, verse 10. 
Then he called the crowds to him and said to them, listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard you say this? He answered, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone, they are blind guides of the blind, and if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Then Jesus said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes into the mouth proceeds from the heart. I'm sorry, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Verse 21. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And the disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is not a passage of scripture that I would eagerly volunteer to preach on, to be quite honest. It's a challenging text, and so I'm thankful for the Revised Common Lectionary offering it up today. We won't solve this text today once and for all, but we can wrestle with it, and we can wonder what words of wisdom it might offer for us today. In Matthew chapter 15, the beginning, we, Jesus finds himself in conflict with the Jewish religious authorities over questions surrounding tradition. At the beginning of the chapter, the Pharisees challenge Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. And that passage is another sermon for another day, but the gist of it is this. God cares more about the state of your heart than strict conformity to the rigid expectations of your religious community. The boundaries that we draw around our communities of faith are not the same boundaries that God would draw. And this is going to have direct bearing on the passage of scripture that we find ourselves reading and encountering today. Jesus begins verse 10 by saying that it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Jesus is referring here to Jewish dietary regulations that suggest that you need to be careful what you eat in order to be holy. And you can track that down more in Leviticus 11 if you're bored later today. Uh, but for example, don't eat the ham biscuits at the next synagogue potluck, right? Uh, Jewish people didn't eat pork and a whole host of other uh, uh, food items. The religious tradition suggests that if you want to worship in the Jew Jerusalem temple, if you want to be seen as acceptable to God, you must be considered clean and pure. You have to follow these rules. And this perspective isn't shared by all Jews of the time, but it is the pre prevailing perspective of the Jewish religious authorities. And I can't help but wonder if we might draw contemporary parallels. Have you ever gotten the sense that you have to be in alignment with certain Christian religious traditions in order to be welcomed into a particular congregation? I would think that many of us could think of a whole host of examples uh, that we've encountered or heard about where Christians say, you have to do this or believe this uh, to be in, to be included in the people of faith. 
The issues that are at stake in this passage are not ones unique to the, to the ancient world. They have contemporary ramifications, to be sure. Jesus goes on to explain that what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. God cares more about the state of your heart than what you put into your belly. And it's fascinating to read this as we transition to verse 21. It's as if Jesus is basically setting himself up. He has just suggested that the condition of one's heart is more important than religious tradition that accepts some and excludes others, right? Uh, and here in this next story, where Jesus encounters a, a Gentile, a, a Canaanite woman, this story will present Jesus with the opportunity to put his money where his mouth is, so to speak. So verse 21, Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. For you geography buffs, this would have been located in the Roman province of Syria. So Jesus has gone into Gentile territory. And this is where it gets interesting to wonder, did he go there on purpose? Remember that Gentiles would not have followed the religious traditions of the Jewish faith, and they would have been viewed as wholly unclean uh, and as foreign outsiders by the Jewish religious authorities. Is it possible that Jesus went there to create a situation in which a concrete example of this previous teaching was possible? Is it possible that the story of the Canaanite woman is a rather elaborate sermon illustration. The text doesn't give us a clear answer, but I can't help but wonder. So lo and behold, an unnamed Canaanite woman comes up to Jesus, desperately shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. She's evidently heard that Jesus is a powerful healer. Uh, his reputation precedes him, and so she's hoping for a miracle. And this is a, a fascinating interaction on a number of levels. For, for starters, she's a bold woman approaching a revered male teacher. Perha perhaps more importantly, though, she's a Gentile. She's coming up to this Jewish teacher, and she calls him Lord and Son of David. These are messianic titles. She's addressing Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. She knows that he has the power to heal her daughter. She seems to have a surprising grasp of Jesus' identity, even more so than his disciples. In fact, it's not until the next chapter of Matthew, which we'll get to in next week's scripture reading, where Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah. So stay tuned for that. And I can't help but wonder, as Jesus is encountering this woman, if perhaps Peter's taking notes uh, so that he can soon confess that Jesus is the Messiah. But Jesus interactions with this woman are troubling for many readers. Jesus doesn't necessarily respond how we might expect, and interpreters for their part are all over the map in trying to figure out what in the world is going on in this passage. Is Jesus simply testing the woman's faith to see if she's worthy of, of this the request? Uh, or perhaps is this actually a turning point in Jesus' own understanding of his ministry that the woman's persistence actually changes his mind. I'll be honest that I struggle with what to make of this story. But here's what happens. Jesus is initially silent in response to her pleas. He stonewalls her. He gives no response. It's stunning to, to some of us, or maybe many of us, I imagine, when we think about how Jesus responds readily to the, the needs of others in the Gospels. And I can't help but think about those times in our own lives when we cry out for God and feel like God is entirely silent to our pleas. When we pray our hardest, and there's not necessarily an outright no response to our prayers, but when we just feel like there is silence, it can be incredibly hard and painful to feel like God is ignoring us. And I have no doubt that it is a painful experience for this woman as well. As she continues to plead with Jesus, his disciples get annoyed that this woman is pestering him. So they say, send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. And again, Jesus' response is problematic. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In effect, Jesus seems to be saying, 
I'm sorry, lady. I was only sent to the Jewish people. You're a Gentile, so I don't even really need to give you the time of day. Your problems are none of my business, to be quite honest. And I read this and I think, come on, Jesus, you're Jesus. You're supposed to heal people and reveal God's power, right? I mean, us good Christians never try to draw lines around who's in and who's out, who's deserving of God's mercy and who isn't, right? This just isn't something good Christians do, right? Uh, and I hope you catch my sarcasm here. To Jesus' credit, in this moment, he doesn't send her away like the disciples ask. This may offer the woman a glimmer of hope and she sees an opening to, to continue. And also to his credit, uh, we, we might imagine that Jesus simply feels like he already has more on his plate than he can handle, simply trying to shepherd all of the lost sheep of Israel. How in the world can he hope to get all of the work done that he is called to do? Time is short. He only has, what, three years? To, to borrow a, a contemporary phrase, nevertheless, she persisted. Like so many amazing women throughout history who have encountered incredible obstacles along the way, Sojourner Truth, Rosa Parks, Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, uh, just to name a few, the Canaanite woman persisted. She comes and kneels before Jesus, a stance that you would assume in the presence of a king. Again, she demonstrates remarkable clarity about who Jesus is. Lord, help me, she begs. She is desperate for her daughter to be healed. And again, Jesus offers a troubling response. It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs, meaning my ministry is directed toward the people of Israel, not to you Gentiles. And did you catch the insult? Jesus effectively calls her a dog. As you might imagine, this insult is every bit as insulting in the first century as it is in the 21st. In fact, for me, this is one of the hardest sayings of Jesus in all of the Gospels, uh, and maybe even all of Scripture. How in the world are we to understand this? And whatever we make of it, for her part, the desperate woman is not deterred by Jesus' repeated rejections. She takes Jesus' comment and, and turns it on its head. Hers is a clever and even witty response. She accepts the designation of dog, uh, and says that even dogs have a place in the household, and even they get to eat whatever falls off the table. So if I am a dog, at least afford me that measure of grace. <laughs> as a side, if she were in my household, she might imagine herself as the cat who persistently jumps on the table trying to steal the food, but that's another analogy for another day. It's here in this context, is it's as if this woman is saying, Lord, I just want the crumbs. Even crumbs of your mercy are enough to heal my daughter. And Jesus immediately praises her faith, and her daughter is healed. It is a stunning and dramatic reversal. A couple of thoughts. One, the woman's persistence and faith are remarkable. She demonstrates an understanding of who Jesus is that seems to surpass even that of his closest disciples. It's remarkable what uh, faith and persistence can do when combined together. And this is not at all who we might expect to be a model of faith in the narrative. And it is certainly not who the disciples expect to show great faith in Jesus. We have to be prepared to see God at work in the lives of people whom we least expect. Moreover, we have to expect that maybe we as Christians and as people of faith still have a lot to learn in, in what it means to be faithful followers and that our learning may come from those who are not at all like us. Two, when reflecting on this passage, I've often thought that this is indeed a turning point for Jesus in his own self-understanding, that his mission in the world is not simply to Jews, but also to Gentiles. Now, this may be the case. I don't know. What I do know is this. Jesus is saying words the disciples expect him to say. And I can't help but wonder, knowing that, that, he's, that perhaps he's actually setting them up for a teachable moment. 
Jesus has already told them that it is not what is external to our being that makes us unclean before God. It's not what we eat. It's not our ethnic background. Rather, it's the state of our heart. Here he shows them what this looks like in dramatic fashion. In this story, we have a woman who is unclean to the core by the typical standards of Jewish religious leaders of the day. And yet she demonstrates in her words and her actions that her heart and her faith are pure. As a Gentile, she prepares the way for the Great Commission at the end of Matthew's Gospel, where Jesus will say, go into all the world and make disciples, not just Jews, not just people who look like us or believe like us, but welcome all into the household of God. This is a passage that invites us to reconsider the boundaries we attempt to draw around our own communities of faith. And the unfortunate reality is that all too often churches persist in trying to define who's in and who's out. Church, the text today speaks a word of encouragement to your congregation. Keep up, <clears throat> excuse me, keep up the good and noble work of acceptance. I know this is already at the, the heart of what it means to be Williamsburg Baptist Church. I know your congregation is a church that tries hard to welcome all people with open arms. And this is a prophetic role you bear in your community. You are bearing witness to a God who is inviting all to the table. Keep up the good work. As we move into a time of invitation and response and worship uh, with our closing hymn, this text also invites us to consider what boundaries we might need to cross and the ways in which we as people of faith might need to move outside of our own comfort zones to encounter and interact with people whom we might otherwise avoid. Jesus, in this passage, moves from the comfort of Israelite territory to the discomfort of Gentile territory. And this border crossing, this boundary crossing, is what sets up the opportunity for faith and healing. What boundaries might we cross safely, you know, given that we're still in the midst of this pandemic? You know, it might be that we need to cross them virtually. But what Boundaries might be crossed nevertheless as we seek to understand the challenges and struggles that other, people's, that other people face simply because they don't share our religious traditions, our ethnic backgrounds, our gender, our socioeconomic sta status, our sexual identity, maybe our political persuasions these days. What this text is offering is a chance to recognize our common and shared humanity and maybe more importantly, the healing and salvation that God offers us all. God bless you, Williamsburg Baptist Church. You are doing a good job. Keep up the good work. Thanks be to God. Amen.
members and guests of Williamsburg Baptist Church receive these words of benediction, originally penned by John Claypool. Go in peace. And as you go, remember, in the goodness of God, you were born into this world. By the grace of God, you have been kept all the day long until this very hour. And by the love of God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus, you are being redeemed. Amen. Go in peace. God bless you.